Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. What are some of the major issues affecting indigenous peoples around the world, such as educational levels, health, poverty, and many others? What are various agencies, such as the United Nations, doing to provide assistance and to work with these folks? My guest today is an expert on this area. My guest is Ms. Chandra Roy Henriksen. Chandra Roy Henriksen, a Chakma from the Chittagong Hill Tracks in Bangladesh, is chief of the Indigenous Peoples and Development Branch in the United Nations. Chandra, welcome to today's Global Connections. Thank you. Welcome. I appreciate you being with me today. Thank this you. is our third attempt at this and been very interesting in the past. Let's get right into it. What does your office do? You're with the Branch Secretary of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. What is, what's the main purpose of that? Uh, we were first established in about uh, 2000, 2001, when the forum, Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues was established, and we were provided like to support their work. But as time went on and our work expanded, and which is a direct reflection of the fact that Indigenous peoples' rights at the UN was gaining greater prominence. So our work also expanded. For instance, we had the World uh, Conference on Indigenous Peoples in 2014. And as our work expanded, we realized that we also needed to have more colleagues come on board. And our work was not just directed specifically at the Permanent Forum, but also also we were also being asked to call in, uh, called in to also provide support, for instance, to the UN Secretary General, to the Under Secretary General. And this resulted then in our office also being now upgraded or expanded mm -hmm. so that we are now a branch which is uh, wonderful and you know thank you very much to this for recognizing this need that we had but also the fact that now that we are a branch of course we're also taking on more responsibility and more tasks Exactly, most surely. And you've got a very interesting website. I want to make sure I get this right. www.un.org backslash development backslash DESA backslash indigenous peoples. And right. our viewers can go to that, get a yep. lot more information mm -hmm. about what we're what we're not going to be able to talk about today and what we are going to be able to talk about. Now this year, well first off, before we get into it, uh, when you hear the term indigenous, probably everybody has a different definition. Uh, I think pretty much of Native Americans, people who were here originally mm -hmm. the first time, but there are more characteristics than just that. How do you briefly define indigenous? Well, first of all, we don't define. You don't define? We don't define. Okay. And this was a decision also taken by the UN member states. Mm -hmm. And as I always say, it's not for lack of intellectual capacity. I'm sure there's lots of bright, very bright people at the member state level at the UN as well. And the reason for that is that when you define something, you also define what it is not. And it was running into the challenge of not being as inclusive as it could be. And so for that reason, what we have is actually a working criteria, working definition, and this was actually provided in 1981-82 by Martinez Cobo in a monumental study, which is four volumes, it's actually also available on our website, and he gave like a criteria, and one of them was historical continuity in a specific area that they are living in, have lived in for generations, for centuries, and also continue to live in. But in addition to that, there is also this distinct uh, desire to keep on with their own traditions, their lifestyles, their dress, for instance, you know, just to say that the dress I'm wearing is uh, chakma. It is our, what we call a pinon and a khadi, mm -hmm. and it's all hand woven. And so it's very something that is going on for generations, and it's transmitted to the future. So what we do is we don't define, we identify. And so in many regions of the country, of the world, there are some where indigenous is more easily acceptable, let's say in Native Americans or in Australia, in the Australian Aborigines, or for instance, the indigenous uh, peoples in the Arctic, the Sami or the Inuit. However, in other regions, it is a bit more mixed and you then ha come into the context of self-identification and so there are many regions where, where people who are otherwise described as tribals, Adivasis, Orang Asals for instance in uh, Malaysia or Masarikat Adat I think that's how they say it in Indonesia or in uh, other countries around the world 
They self-identify as indigenous, and I think that's mm -hmm. one of the contexts that we have to keep in mind. Exactly. Now, of the 7.4 billion people on the planet today, or approximately how many would be not defined, but who would say, I'm indigenous? <laughs> well, uh, I think it was uh, the World Bank that first mm -hmm. came up with this figure, and I'm not an economist or statistician, so I don't know. So we are we go on with that figure, and the, it was 370 million, mm -hmm. and the, it is all around the world in different countries. I mean, whether it's in Sweden, Finland, Norway, or in the United States, or in Latin America and the Caribbean, Asia, Africa, Pacific, mm -hmm. it is a people who are either recognized sometimes officially by their governments and otherwise also self-identify as indigenous. Now in 20, well let's see, in March of this year you had a permanent forum on indigenous issues and you had a gathering of mm -hmm. people from all around the world. What was the purpose of that and what were some of the major recommendations that came out of it? What were some of the major issues you dealt with? Mm. Now just to explain that the UN as it has been working on indigenous issues from the very start in the 1980s when it had a UN working group on indigenous populations. That was the first UN entity and uh, body on indigenous uh, peoples. And now it has three mechanisms. One is the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples, the special rapporteur on the rights of indigenous peoples, and the permanent forum, which is permanent forum on indigenous issues, which is based here. I mean, they have the annual gatherings here at the UN. And through the years since the forum was established and has been having these annual meetings, it has been recognized as providing the space, the platform, the uh, the the venue. Mm -hmm for the global gathering of indigenous issues. And here you have member states, you have ministers, we even have presidents coming, for instance, President Morales, and we've also had community leaders or elders or indigenous women who come. And it's about, if you count in total, it's about over, over 1,500 to nearly 2,000 people who come. That's a large year. number. It's a large number and we have, Although it is a little bit bigger, our team is about 12 colleagues, so we have about 100 each, 100 plus <laughs> each <laughs> to, to work with. <laughs> but who's counting, <laughs> right? <laughs> but it's also a time when the UN kind of wakes up and suddenly you, know, you have all these indigenous peoples coming, for instance, since we are in, in uh, USA, we have a Native American chief mm -hmm. doing the formal opening at the General Assembly Hall, and that's something very powerful when you see these people coming. You'll have, you know, women coming, <coughs> indigenous women, you'll have leaders, <coughs> ministers, and it's a very good place to come to if you're working on indigenous issues. You also have academics and, you know, time to network. They also showcase events around it, so we have a lot of parallel events going on, mm -hmm. so it's a very interesting and exciting time. Mm -hmm. You should definitely be there. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now, the issues, if I think of indigenous peoples, I think of people living in the Amazon area, mm -hmm. Native Americans, uh, Aborigines, you mentioned the Maoris in New Zealand, just on across the board. And they are, they have some, well, we all have Mm -hmm. issues we're dealing with, challenges yeah. we're dealing with. And in some areas there, there are health issues, there are educational issues, there are issues of losing their land, being mm -hmm. forced off of their land. Uh, what are some of the major ones that you're dealing with now? I'm sure all of those I mentioned are probably very important, but what are some of the ones you're looking at now and what's, mm -hmm. what progress have we made as far as maybe providing assistance or uh, helping people to improve their educational level, nutritional level, and mm -hmm. that type of thing. Well, you know, you'd actually asked what was the theme of the permanent forum mm -hmm. session this year, and the theme was lands, territories, and resources. And this is in direct recognition to the fact that land is central to the identity of indigenous peoples. They don't have just a, it's not just an economic or consumption relationship that they have with the land, but it's also where they have the spiritual basis, the mm -hmm. cultural identity. So it's very, very, very key in terms of the survival of indigenous peoples, their rights, their identity, and their, you know, the whole people, the nations. So one of the main issues remains around that area. I mean, we had the two-week session of the forum, and this is two intense weeks where you had a lot of discussions around this central theme, 
And what emerged is that although there are some good examples and there were, you know, some, there have been recognition of indigenous areas, indigenous people's lands, just for example, the Nunavut in the Canada, Nunavut area, that is recognized as an indigenous people's area, Greenland, or in other countries around the world. But at the same time, there is increasing pressure on indigenous people's lands, and they are being pushed more and more to the margins. So, of course, this also impacts very much negatively in most cases in terms of the education and health outcomes. We were just trying to see if we could pull out some stats on statistics on indigenous people's education and health outcomes in different countries. And I was just looking at what the colleagues had uh, been able to find. And wherever they may be, whether it's in, in Canada or in Australia or in New Zealand, the outcomes for indigenous peoples are always much, much, much more grave than it is for non-indigenous populations. And of course, when you look at, let's say, education, a very concrete mm -hmm. example, for instance, is, let's say, girls' education, you know? Girls' education. Girls, okay. you know, young girls going to school. And in many of these uh, communities, the girls also help their mothers in terms of the household chores fetching water. If you're living in a remote community somewhere, you know, you will take much more time for you to go down. I'm just thinking of where we, I live. It's, uh, we have a dammed river, which is now a lake. And, you know, the girl will go down, fetch water, come up. By the time she comes up, you know, she may be too late to go to school. Mm -hmm. So this, of course, has a impact on her development and also in her future so that it's also limited in terms of its potential and that's where I believe the UN has to come in with much much more attention and action because unless we do something and it's not just the UN because the UN you have the member states they are the ones who are actually with the resources to be able to provide in their countries and of course all these people are also <coughs> the citizens so it has to be equal access, equal uh, service delivery, and these are responsibilities and actions that the UN is urging. And of course, the Permanent Forum, as an advisory body to the UN, to the Economic and Social Council, is also stressing that and noting in its report that there has been progress because we are now 11 years since the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was adopted. And yet progress is very much uneven, both within and mm -hmm. outside of yeah. countries, within countries, but also within the countries themselves. So it's very mm -hmm. much, uh, no, it's mixed picture. In some countries you have recognition of indigenous peoples. Bolivia, for instance, just to cite an example, actually took the UN declaration and made it in national law. There are other countries, Canada now is also looking into it and working on other um, interventions that it could provide to redress the injustices that indigenous peoples in Kanta have faced. Other countries are also working on that, and that's where I believe that we can provide some mm -hmm. support, some guidance, you know, sharing of good practices. And of course, that's very true. The governments and the non-governmental organizations, mm -hmm. UN agencies, mm -hmm. can all provide, they can lend a hand to help in this particular area. And it's very important, especially with governments, because they so often have to defend or help defend the mm -hmm. rights mm -hmm. of indigenous peoples. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We would invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with any type of television or media outlet, perhaps PBS or Community Access Television, or you're involved with it, an educational institution that has an intra campus television hookup, or you have a website and you just want to help share our programs, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided at no cost as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today we're talking with Ms. Chandra Roy Henriksen, who heads up the Indigenous uh, uh, issues division at the uh, United Nations and she's bringing us up to date on many of the issues confronting indigenous peoples around the world the 300 plus million Chandra you mentioned the U United Nations Declaration on Indigenous or Indigenous right. Issues mm -hmm. that's right what exactly is that 
Well, the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was adopted in September 2007 by the United Nations General Assembly and it was 20 years in the making and 20 years of intense discussions, lobbying and mm -hmm. advocacy. But also when the declaration itself was adopted, it was consensus that this in itself, all that uh, it actually embodies the minimum standards for the well-being, survival and dignity of indigenous peoples around the world. There were four countries that voted against the, sign, uh, against the adoption of the declaration and all four countries have since reversed their positions and now support mm -hmm. the declaration. So in a way now we have unanimous uh, agreement around the declaration. Which is, uh, excuse me, no small accomplishment. That's no quite, a, small. quite an accomplishment to get, how many countries at that time, 180 something yeah, were? And uh, today you have 193, but 93. That's, that's a tremendous accomplishment. Yes, some abstained, mm -hmm. but, you know, but others, you know, it was by the majority of the UN General Assembly. One of the key elements of the declaration, and this is also in terms of when it was being drafted, was that indigenous peoples were very much involved. I was myself at that time at the, what I, uh, the UN Working Group on Indigenous Populations, and we were very much in, engaged as indigenous representatives in how the declaration should be drafted, what are the issues it should include, what are the concepts, what are the rights. And one thing that it has actually put into practice at the UN is that indigenous people should be involved when the UN is working on anything that affects them. Mm -hmm. And the same practice was actually used, followed during the uh, preparations for the high level event of the General Assembly, which led to the world, which is known as the World Conference on Indigenous uh, Peoples in 2014 in September. And Indigenous peoples were also involved, they were there as advisors throughout, they were also there in preparing the discussions, in round tables. So it was a very, in that way, a very uh, productive process as well as the result. And with the World Conference now we have an outcome document which also leads to a lot of different issues that we are now following up on. And one of them was that the UN was asked to prepare a system-wide action plan. Because of course the UN, there's so many different agencies, there are many of us colleagues, all working with great passion and commitment, <laughs> but all with many different issues. And they said, how can we actually synergize all this and get them all to work together? in a much more coordinated and of course that will also be more powerful and stronger and so we have the system-wide action plan which was prepared under the guidance of the Under Secretary General of Department of Economic and Social Affairs where we are based and it was adopted under the leadership of the Secretary General and it was agreed by the Chief Executive's Board in November 2015 and now we are in implementation because of course where are indigenous peoples the most uh, relevant and active? Mm -hmm. It's at the country level. So this is where we are actually working with the UN country teams, with our UN agency colleagues to make sure that the declaration is implemented at the country level through the system-wide action plan. Mm -hmm. Which is very important. Now we've talked a little bit about the education, the oh. Uh, human rights, we talked about nutritional levels, uh, different things like that, but one thing we have not focused on too much is probably the number one problem, and that's climate change. And of course, indigenous peoples are right on the front line. We're all experiencing adverse climate ca change situations, but indigenous peoples live it every day, and I'm sure that it, I can't say for sure, but anyway, I would imagine just about all of the indigenous peoples around the world are having some negative effects from climate change because it seems like every country is having negative effects. How, how, do, how do you deal with this particular issue? Is this one of your top priorities or where, where does that fall? It is becoming one of our top priorities more as we, you know, as we go. And uh, we were just, you know, when you look at climate change, it's affecting the whole world, global yes. warming. Exactly. And, uh, you know, I was just on a personal level, my, my husband is from Norway. So I thought, well, it's great, you all will have, you know, he's from the Arctic Circle, you'll have warmer weather there. But what's the effect of global warming on these Arctic areas is that the snow is melting. 
which means that you know you'll have less salmon the reindeer the waters it's not just that they're melting like even in uh, Greenland mm -hmm. it has an impact on marine life on the levels of the coastal waters which is also for instance in the Pacific sometimes with these melting waters mm -hmm. The ice, the water levels, sea waters are on the rise, which means some of these low-lying areas then are going to be flooded. Where does that mean indigenous people will go? And this is something which indigenous peoples actually have been facing for many years. It's now that suddenly the world is waking up a bit more to what are the challenges they face. And it's... Uh, it's one where indigenous peoples actually have much they can contribute. They've been living with this for many years. They, for instance, um, when we had the tsunami in 2004 in uh, Asia, mm -hmm. Southeast Asia, they, they were looking at some of the examples where indigenous peoples actually c could tell that there was something that was going to happen just because of the way the animals were or the plants were or something so they are there's a lot of traditional knowledge there that could be used and utilized because not just that they're at the front lines but you have to remember they've also been able to survive at the front lines and I think that's where we have a lot of lessons we can learn from that's very true I remember reading articles on when that uh, one of the tsunamis that hit that area that many of the people the indigenous peoples who lived there and had experienced this before got in boats and started driving moving out to moving sea out. because the tsunami was coming in under the surface and they knew exactly. that they wouldn't want to be on the shore that's for sure but you know the uh, this climate change is it's de the climate's deteriorating very quickly the gov the intergovernmental panel on climate change the mm -hmm. UN uh, IPCC came out with a recent report saying that we have 10 years at best to try to get it under control and yet we see more and more scientific studies of the oceans are warming that's going to destroy the coral reefs there's more acidification in the oceans as you mentioned the, mm -hmm. the ice caps are melting polar bears habitats are going to disappear the reindeer habitats going to disappear and we've got to take immediate action will this be a high priority item when you meet again next year mm -hmm. and will you be focusing on it <laughs> Yes, because next year the theme of the Permanent Forum, and I have to say full admiration to the Permanent Forum members that in their wisdom, this year they identified lands, territories and resources. Last year it was actually conflict. Mm -hmm. And this year, next year it's going to be on traditional knowledge. And these are the areas they want to look at, that through n the lens of traditional knowledge, how are we dealing with the environment, with climate change, with loss of lands, with many other issues. And I, this is going to be more and more, I think, on the agenda, even as we go forward. You know, there's so many different processes that are ongoing that are related to these issues. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And of course, we all have to lend a hand on this because we live on this, as they say, the blue marble together, mm -hmm. planet Earth, and there's no planet B. There's no plan B and no planet B. Yes. What role can the media play to help focus attention on this and to provide more information about the plight of many indigenous peoples, the indigenous issues, indigenous peoples' issues, and what we can do. In our last 35 seconds, the hardest, <laughs> hardest question. <laughs> I think the media plays a key role, and I think, I believe you can play an even more, you know, even uh, a bigger role as such, because now with all these, uh, I see the young people, how they play, how they savvy they are with all these social media, the text, and you have one thing here and it immediately goes out to thousands. And in that way, the media, I think, if they were able to pick up the stories of indigenous peoples, not just when they are killings, mm -hmm. we right. have many of that, and that is a grave issue that is continuing, the human rights uh, defenders who are of indigenous origin also being targeted. But the fact also of the good practices that could be done, or the fact that this is an issue that is coming up, if they can draw attention, that also will mm -hmm. perhaps help diffuse the tension, prevent the conflict from going further. If there is media attention, as you said, you know, many of these with the human rights uh, defenders, that these are happening, many of them in remote areas where there is no media attention. And I feel that the media mm -hmm. could actually play a, 
role in highlighting this and in such way preventing it from happening. Mm -hmm. And you have a great role to play. It's very, very important that they do that, and hopefully they will play that role. But Chandra Roy Henriksen, it's a very important topic, and I look forward to hearing about your next forum, especially talking about traditional knowledge. Mm -hmm. We never had a chance to get into talking about the medicines that are provided mm -hmm. from the rainforest and exactly. in Brazil and different places. But I want to thank you so very much oh, for a you. very interesting and a very informative program. <laughs> thank you. Very good to have you. Thank you. Be here with you. <laughs> Always a pleasure. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.